Well, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. You know, last week we uh, ended with a story about a couple who um, decided, if you remember, they, uh, they decided to get this little house, a little cottage house that they had. They decided to, to give that cottage, um, to sell it, and then give those funds back to their church so that their church could be free. You know, they, they decided to sell their house so that God's house could be paid in full, if you remember that. I, I told you how that one act of generosity in that story, uh, it led to many other people being willing to also give to the church, but also there were many people that came to a saving knowledge of Christ as a result of that one act of generosity. What I want to do today, I, I want to kind of show you, if you will, kind of a, a biblical idea of that story uh, 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 in here, a story from the from the Bible from this. It's, it's found in Exodus chapter number 35. Exodus chapter 35. It, it involves the Israelites, okay? And we'll, we'll explain some of that here in a little bit. It involves the Israelites building the tabernacle for God. So they were going to build this tabernacle. This would, would basically be kind of a temporary uh, house of God, a temporary place. They, they would pack, they would build this thing, and then when God would move them, they would pack it up and they would move along, and then they would reconstruct it. They were a mobile church, kind of like us, right? Uh, in this. But but anyway, so in Exodus 35, they're going to build this tabernacle here. Before we dive into this story, though, I want to kind of fill you in on the book of Exodus. I want to kind of fill you in on the Israelites, who these people are, just in case maybe you're not familiar uh, with their story, who the Israelites are, you're not familiar with the book of Exodus and all that, just so you understand where we're coming from and what's going on, okay? So the Israelites, okay, this is like God's chosen people. They're the Jewish nation, okay? The Israelites have been, in, they have been slaves in Egypt for like 400 years. They've been slaves in Egypt. They, they were the ones who were responsible for kind of building the nation of Egypt. They, they, they kind of built it. They, they were the indentured servants of Egypt. They were, they, they, they were the, the blue-collar industry of the nation of Egypt. Basically, if, if anything got built, if anything had been crafted, if anything had been designed in Egypt, the Israelites were the people who probably did it. But then God sends a deliverer to deliver these Israelites, the Jewish people, out of Egypt. This is a guy you probably heard of. His name was Moses. Moses being empowered by God to go and to release the people of Israel. Moses went. Uh, he spoke with the Pharaoh. Let my people go. You probably know that phrase, right? Uh, let my people go. And, and Moses, he, uh, the Pharaoh was, was very reluctant. He didn't want to release the, the, the Egyptians. Why not, right? That was his workforce. And so he didn't want to release them. So Moses, empowered by God, he begins to pass judgments or plagues onto the, the, the people of Egypt and over the land there. So they left uh, they left Egypt, and they're finally being free. They finally got free after 10 of these plagues. They, they left Egypt, and, and, and as they were leaving, the Pharaoh changed his mind. He wants them back, so he sends his armies to go and to get the, the Jewish people and to recapture them. So they're running from, from Pharaoh and his army. They get stalled at the Red Sea. Right? So they're stalled at the Red Sea. They got the Egyptian armies coming after them. But once again, God delivers them. And God parts the Red Sea. He allows the Israelites to cross on dry ground. As the Egyptian army tries to pursue and to follow them, the waters fall back down and it drowns the entire army. And they are now safe out of Egypt. They now begin to walk through the desert, carrying everything that they owned with them. Uh, when they were walking through the desert and they got thirsty. God delivered once again, and God provided them water from a rock of all places. God provides them water. When they got hungry, God provided for them. And God would, 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 would literally allow birds to fall from the sky so that they could pick them up and eat them. God also gave them this miraculous bread that they called manna. Every morning they could go and they could pick up this bread and eat. And so God provided for them. When they were lost or unprotected in the desert, God would lead them. And God would protect them with a pillar of fire at nighttime and a pillar of cloud during the daytime. God was taking care of them. And so God was doing all of this to provide and protect for them. But when God told the Israelites how to live in relationship with him, when God began to set up that structure of this, this relationship with him, the Israelites rebelled. They wanted to do their own thing. 
They wanted to live the way they wanted to live. And so they rebelled against his law. And so then God's anger burned against his own people. And, the, and, and, and he was ready to destroy them all in all reality. But their, their leader, Moses, he interceded for them. And, and Moses pleaded to God not to do that. He offered his life, an innocent life, for their guilt, if you will. So God relented of that. And God did not destroy them. They faced some consequences for their sins. And some judgment was passed on, 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 on the ones who continued in that rebellion. But, but now it seems that the people, they're back on track. They're back on track with God. They've come to recognize how God has blessed them. How God has been generous to them. They have seen God's grace as he made them his people. And how he's, he's leading them to this promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. And, and now they, they want to dwell with God. They, they want to be with God. They want to be uh, in relationship with him. And, and so God has promised to do that with this tabernacle, with this house that would be dedicated to him. They saw the radiance of Moses when Moses had an encounter with God. And they saw this radiance after him, after Moses experienced the holiness of God. And, and they come to their senses. They want that. They want a piece of that. They, they want that relationship with, with God just like Moses had. So God had gave Moses instructions on how to build this tabernacle. Actually, they're very detailed uh, instructions on how to build this tabernacle. And now it's time for the Israelites to get to work. Now it's time for them to start building this tabernacle. Okay. So with all of that in, in, in our minds now, okay, now that we're fresh on this story and what's going on, I want us to see today, from, from the example of these Israelites, I want us to see that a generous God should lead to generous people. A generous God should lead to generous people. Why? Because of this. Hearts full of gratitude overflow into hands of generosity. We've been talking now for the last few weeks on this idea of thanks and giving, developing a heart of gratitude. And I told you that, that when we develop a heart of gratitude, that that was, should naturally lead into hands of generosity, where we want to be involved with this. And so, so this is the idea. A heart that is full of gratitude is going to overflow into hands of generosity. Look with me in Exodus chapter 35, would you? Exodus chapter 35. Beginning in verse number four here, in the first three verses, he, he's given some, some regulations about the Sabbath and, and, and how they're to, to respect the, the Sabbath and that. Get in verse number four. And down in verse number nine, it says, Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linens, goat's hair, tanned ram skins and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and stones for setting and for the ephod and for the breast piece. So Moses instructed the people here. He, he instructs them to, to take from among you a contribution to the Lord. That's what he says, right? Verse number five. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. But he provides this, this list of materials uh, given here. But before announcing the list, notice here that Moses, he clarified the type of contribution that Israel was to, supposed to give them. Did he catch it? Look what he said there in verse number five. It says, and whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution. The word generous heart there, it's translated from two different Hebrew words, which when you put them together, they mean something like a, a freely giving heart. It's a freely giving heart. Look, Moses is inviting the people to give. He's inviting them to bring what is necessary to build this tabernacle here. But, but listen, this offering was not mandated. It wasn't something they had to give. It wasn't something they were being coerced into doing. The Israelites were to give freely. As, as, as they were moved in their hearts, they were to give. Well, let me pause here for a moment, because some of you might be thinking, after filling you in on, on, on the story of the Israelites, you're probably thinking, what do they even have? <laughs> They've been slaves for 400 years, you know? How, how do they have any kind of wealth? How do they have any kind of uh, money, you know? And, and ever since they, they got freed out of Egypt, they've just been wandering through a wilderness. So how in the world did they collect anything uh, in, in this? You know, so just in case you're thinking about it, let me give you the answer. Very simply, what I'd say, the Egyptians... And from another group of people called the Amalekites. That's where they got all their stuff. 
you, you, you could probably say that they fought for it. You could probably say that they slaved for it, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, in this, but but, but they, they, they kind of earned this, if you will. Or you could say that God blessed them with it. You see, after all those plagues that, that came upon them, you know, and Moses, you know, and let the people go and all that, all the plagues came, especially the tenth one, which was the, the, the death of the firstborn there in Egypt. And that's the one that kind of, they were like, okay, get out of here. We're done with you guys. When that happened, the people of Egypt, they were so afraid of the Israelites, and they were so afraid of the God that they worshipped, that they were like, hey, you know, get out of here. But, but hey, as you're leaving, won't you take this too? Here, take my gold. Here, take my silver. Here, take, take this bronze. Here, take all this stuff. And they were so afraid of it that they were trying to appease, because that's what they knew about gods. They were trying to appease the God that the Israelites worshipped. So they literally just gave them their wealth there uh, uh, and, and all that. And then once they crossed that Red Sea and they were going through the wilderness, they came up on this other pagan group. The, the, the group was called the Amalekites. And they ended up in a battle with these Amalekites. But against all odds, they, they ended up winning that battle. And, and through that, they took the Amalekites' wealth. And so that's where they, they got all their stuff. And so you, you could say for that wealth from the Amalekites that they won that in the battle. That they earned that for themselves, if you would. You, you could say that, but if you read the story of that and how that happens, it's a crazy story because the Israelites should have never even been able to do that. One, they weren't soldiers, they were slaves. But they end up winning this war, they win this battle, and they fought and this and that. But when you read the story, it's a fascinating story because what would happen was is that Moses went up on, on this kind of mountainside there and, and he was overlooking this battle as it's taking place. And, and the Bible tells us that, that when Moses would, would raise his, his rod, his staff up in the air, that the Israelites would win the battle. But if Moses lowered this rod, this staff, then the Amalekites would start winning the battle. And so Moses would hold that rod up there, but obviously, you know, if you hold something up in the air for a really long time, your arm gets tired, right? And, and, and so it was tough for him to do. And so there was two guys that came up, and they, they got next to Moses, and, and they would hold his arms up, one on each side, so that he could hold that staff up over his head so that the Israelites could win that battle. So again, who really won the battle? It wasn't God. And God did that for them. So that's where their wealth came from. These, these people had nothing as slaves. They now seemingly are pretty wealthy people. They got, they got quite a lot uh, uh, for themselves, if you will. And, and think about this for a moment. You would think that these people who had nothing and now they got quite a lot, you would think they might want to kind of naturally be pretty stingy with that, you know? Uh, because now they're like, hey, I finally got, got this. You know, we, we deserve this. This is our right to have this. I'm not giving this away. I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to make sure my kids are okay and their kids are going to be okay. We're, we're going to hang on to this wealth for ourselves here. But that's not what they did. In fact, look at the response of the people here. Look at Exodus chapter 35 and, and down in verse 21. Down to verse 29. Look, look what it says. It says, And they come, everyone whose heart stirred him, and everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting, and for all its service, and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, all, catch it again, who were of a willing heart, brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and armlets and all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating after uh, dedicating an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue or purple or scarlet yarns and fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ram skins or goat skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. And everyone who possessed acacia wood and, and of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands, and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skill spun the goats here. And the leaders brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastpiece and spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the men and the women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it, watch again, as a free will offering to the Lord. Oh, my goodness. What a response. 
Moses, he puts this plea out. This is God's tabernacle. This is what we want to do. And, and he says, if you're of a willing and a generous heart, you can give. And all these people begin to bring. The Israelites were so grateful in their hearts for all that God had done for them. The way that God had been so generous to them that that, that, that allowed that, 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 that gratitude to flow into hands of generosity. The Israelites' willingness to give was an overflow of a thankful heart. They were so thankful for what God had done. They could have been bitter. They could have been pretty mad about the situation. They were in slavery for 400 years. They could have been very upset about everything that had taken place in their life. But instead, they were generous with what God had blessed them with. They were grateful for this. And out of that, that thankful heart, they begin to give. And here's what I notice when I look at this passage. It took two types of people. It took two types of people here in, in, in this passage for them to, to get this tabernacle done. It took contributors and it took crafters. It took contributors and it took crafters. When you look back on the, on the text there, you're going to see that, 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 that some people, they contributed goods, right? They, they, they gave the gold, they gave the yarns, they gave the supplies and all that for the work. But there were other people who actually spun the yarn, spun the goat's hair, who, who put themselves to work building this tabernacle. So there were contributors and there were crafters in this. Look, that teaches me that there's a part for everybody to play. In the work of the Lord, in his church, in his, his work, everybody has a part that they can play. Some people are contributors and they're going to donate the goods and maybe they're going to donate the funds. They're going to donate. But other people that say, hey, maybe I don't have something to give, but I can use my hands to, to, to work with what's been given. There's a part for everybody to play. We, we don't have any kind of excuse when it comes to serving God. We all have a part. We can be contributors or we can be crafters. You can, you can play a role in this. Just as God equipped Moses to lead the Israelites. If you look at that story, Moses didn't think he was fit to lead the people. He actually offered up a bunch of excuses of why he shouldn't be doing it. But God, God used him, and God equipped Moses to lead the Israelites, and, 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 and he used Aaron, and he used that famous staff and that rod, and, 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 and man, just as God kept his promise to Joshua and allowed Joshua to, to lead the Israelites to defeat the Canaanites and enter into the promised land, just as God gave Esther the courage to go before the king, he will also equip us with the task that he gives us. God will equip us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 8. It says that God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. God will take care of you. God needs contributors and crafters in his work to build his church, to build his kingdom. God is not going to call us to something and leave us to fend for ourselves. He's not going to ask you to do something and then not take care of you in that. He is with us. He provides for us, and he enables us to finish the assignments that he gives us. By the way, in the verses leading up to this passage here in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, verse 8, just by the way, it talks about giving. It's all about giving. And that God will take care of us in that. Look, God has equipped you to do the work. And if you're not a contributor or a crafter in the church, then I suggest that you probably don't have a true heart of thanks toward God. And that's kind of a harsh thing to say. But if you're not getting involved in the work of God, if you're not getting involved in serving Him and in, 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 in living for Him and being His hands and His feet on this earth, then you probably don't have a true heart of thanks for what God has done for you. Israel, they had witnessed God in powerful ways. They had seen God at work. God had delivered them from bondage in Egypt and enabled them to cross that Red Sea. God had provided that manna from heaven for them. He had given them water from a rock. He had promised his presence to go with Israel on their journey. And out of an overflow of gratitude in their hearts, they wanted to give back. Why? Because generosity is gratitude in action. Generosity is gratitude in action. We give what? Because we're thankful for what God's done for us. We're thankful for the way that he works. And man, did these people give. In fact, look, look, look what happens here. Go into chapter 36 now. 
beginning in verse number, number three. It says, and they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning. So that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task that he was doing, and said to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work of the, uh, that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave a command and word and was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were res restrained from bringing. For the material they had was sufficient to do the work and more. Can you believe this? They, they had such an overflow of generosity that the people who were crafting, those people who were doing the work and building it, they, they, they were like, man, listen, we've got way too many supplies. We have way more than enough that we need to build this tabernacle. Moses, can you please just have these people stop giving? Have you heard a church say that today? <laughs> right? We don't hear that today, do we? But they had brought so much for the work of the Lord that the people were like, listen, this is enough. And Moses actually had to put a stop on what they were doing. Because if they had something to give, they were giving it. Every morning they were coming and giving more. Because they were so grateful. But think about this for a minute. It wasn't just those who built it wasn't just those who, who were building the sanctuary. It wasn't just those who were contributing to those things. But it was also those who supported the builders. Think about this. The people who stopped to start building the, the, the tabernacle. Who was going to fill in what they were doing on their daily routines? They had to give up their life to go in and build the tabernacle, right? But who was going to now do their jobs? Who was going to do their daily tasks and fill in? There were people who were filling in the gaps here. Some people were, were, were building the tabernacle, but other people were behind the scenes filling in the gaps and, and, and doing what, what they could do to make sure that those people were able to build this tabernacle. People were filling in everywhere they could in order to make sure that God's house was built accordingly. Again, hearts full of gratitude, overflow with a hand generosity. When we realize what God has done for us, when we realize where God has brought us out of our own lives, how can we not want to give back? How can we not want to say, God, here's my life. You use it however you see fit because I, I have no life apart from you. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Use me. God, here's my finances. Here's, here's my money. Here, here, here's, God, whatever you need, it's yours. Because I love you. And I'm thankful for you. And all that you've done. Did you know that research has found that there's a neurological link between gratitude and generosity? Scientifically, there's this neurological link. In an article published in Greater Good Magazine in 2017, uh, this lady, Christina Carnes, she shared these findings. She said, in a sense, gratitude seems to prepare the brain for generosity. Counting blessings is quite different than counting your cash because gratitude, just as philosophers and psychologists predict, points us towards moral behaviors and pay it forward motivations. Apparently, our brain literally makes us feel richer when others do well. Perhaps this is why researchers have observed that grateful people give more. Gratitude might be good for us, but it is good for others as well. Fascinating. That there's a neurological link in this, that, that we would develop this pay it forward motivation. And we actually saw this play out back in the middle of the pandemic. Back in December of 2020, in the middle of, of, of our global pandemic, uh, and there you, you think about all the social crisis and all the things that were taking place uh, in the middle of that time, uh, and, there, and, and, and probably we, we, we really struggled with whether there was any goodness in humanity a lot of times in, in these things, right? And, and those, but there was a, this little social phenomenon going on in a little town called Brainerd, Minnesota. And it all started at a Dairy Queen. They're in Minnesota. Think about this. It's December. Who's going to Dairy Queen in December <laughs> in Minnesota, right? But anyway, in this Dairy Queen in Brainerd, Minnesota, it all started, I guess there was one customer going through the, the drive-thru, and, and that customer decided, I'm going to pay for the person's food behind me. 
So that person, they said, hey, I want to buy my food, but I'm going to pay the person behind me as well. The next person pulled up, and they told them what had happened, and that person said, well, I'll just pay for the person behind me then. And so they did that. And so then the next person pulled up, they told them what happened, and they said, well, well I'll just pay the person behind me. And this started a chain reaction that, that went through 900 customers, mm -hmm. over $10,000 in sales. It lasted two and a half days mm -hmm. of people simply paying it forward. When the store was shut down for the night, on both nights, the last customer who, who, who was in the drive-thru, they said, here, let me go ahead and pay for the person who's going to be coming in the morning. And that's how it continued into the next day. The, the, the goodness it impacted more than just that 900 customers, though, because it, it began to, to, to make the news. The employees at the Dairy Queen were impacted by what was happening with these people being so kind. It started trending on social media uh, here. Everybody in their community was encouraged and uplifted, witnessing all of this, uh, uh, this, this going on, this pay it forward mentality, this gratitude in action, if you will, in, 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 in all of it. Because what happens is that when we develop a heart of gratitude, it leads to a life of thanks and giving. What a gift. You see, God has wired us in such a way that when we obey his command to be great to him, we improve our own lives and also the lives of everyone around. And my prayer is that Exponential Church would be such a place. Amen. That we would be such a people full of gratitude for all that God has done for us. That we would become a generous people. That our, our gratitude would overflow into hands of generosity. That's a life of thanks. God, we come to you today so incredibly thankful for all that you've done in our lives. We're not saying life is perfect. We're not saying life has gone exactly the way that we wanted it to go. But even in the midst of everything, you've still been faithful. You've still been good. And you've never turned your back on us. God, I pray that we would see that today. No matter what stage of life we're in, no matter what's going on in the world around us, God, may we see your goodness. May we see your blessing. And God, may we be a grateful people that we would have a heart of gratitude. And God, I pray that that heart of gratitude would lead the hands of generosity that every single person in this room, God, that we would realize that, that we could be contributors or we could be crafters in your work. And God, we can give up our resources, we can be the resource to go out and to further your kingdom. And God, I pray that when people see Exponential Church and those that make up this local assembly of believers, that when they see us in tradition, when they see us in Fort St. Lucie or Stewart or Fort Pierce or surrounding areas, whenever they would see us out and about, they would see hands of generosity. And they would recognize that it's out of an overflow of our grateful hearts to you. Make us such a people. God, we would give so much. That we'd literally be like, hey, that's enough. We've done enough. Because we're so willing to give. God, we want to give you all the honor glory and the praise for our lives. Because apart from you, we had nothing. And we recognize that today. It's in your wonderful son's name, the greatest gift of all time. It is in his